Hello, gentlemen. Welcome to chapter 15.7 on Le Chatelier's principle. Now, in industrial chemistry, many chemists and engineers make a living by trying to maximize the amount of products that they can produce, especially the ones that are valuable. Now, this was first done, and I'll say first because of, you know, I don't really know who first did it, but the first recorded documentation of this being done was through was by a guy named Fritz Haber. We talked about him in class. He was able to produce ammonia from pure nitrogen and pure hydrogen gas. Now, this nitrogen-containing compound, ammonia, was very valuable. It was a valuable product. Now, we know that at equilibrium, the production of more NH3, you know, somewhat stops. I put stops in quotations because it doesn't stop. You know, it's in equilibrium, so the reactants are being <clears throat> turned into products and products are being turned into reactants, so it doesn't really stop but you're not really increasing the concentration of NH3. And Fritz Haber wanted to change that. He wanted more NH3 and he wanted to see, well, how can I manipulate this reaction to create more of my valuable product? And many chemists and chemical engineers have adopted this practice and it's kind of how industrial chemistry works nowadays. People make really, really good money by learning to manipulate um, chemical, chemical reactions. So what he did was he examined how reaction conditions might be varied to increase your yield of your product. Now he based his concepts off of previous work done by a guy named Henri Louis Le Chatelier. Now Le Chatelier was a French chemist who did a lot of work in trying to figure this out himself, but due to a laboratory accident, he kind of had to, you know, put his uh, beakers down and, you know, make way for someone else to do it. And Fritz Haber was the guy to pick up where Le Chatelier left off. But Le Chatelier is responsible for this major principle, which reads that if a system at equilibrium is disturbed by a change in concentration, pressure, or temperature, the system will shift its equilibrium position so as to counter the effect of the disturbance. This is simply saying that in equilibrium we're talking about a balance. So... If you were to alter the concentration, the pressure, or temperature, while that system was in equilibrium, you would upset the balance and tip it to one way or another. Le Chatelier's principle is saying, well, that system will kind of fix itself. So if, you know, one side of the balance gets hairier than the other side, the other side will fix itself to restore that balance. Now, we're going to talk about these three different conditions, concentration, pressure, and temperature. The our first condition is when we change the concentration of our reactants or products. So we can use the Haber process again as a, an example. Now let's say the concentration of our reactants was increased. So we added more N2 and H2 or H2. Um, to the system and it's no longer balanced meaning it's no longer at equilibrium so N2 and H2 to restore this balance will have to react together to produce more NH3 and that restores the balance so if you increase the concentration of your reactants that means you have more reactants than products your reactants will react together to create more NH3 to restore the balance so we say in chemistry that equilibrium shifts to the right towards your products in this case. Now the same reasoning can be applied if more NH3 is added. So if we have more NH3 being added here, then we have a higher concentration of NH3 than we do of our reactants. So NH3 is going to decompose and form more of our reactants, thus restoring the balance. Now, if the concentration of NH3 is reduced, balance is restored by producing more NH3. So if I have my NH3 here, and this concentration goes down, in order to balance that concentration going down, more NH3 will have to be produced my reactants will have to produce more NH3 if the concentration of NH3 itself um, is decreased. 
So, here, when concentration increases, equilibrium shifts to the opposite side of the reaction. And when concentration decreases, equilibrium shifts to the same side of the reaction. Our second condition is when the pressure of a system changes. We can change the pressure by changing the volume. And since we're talking about changing and changes of pressure, we have to simply look at this in terms of gaseous substances. So if a system containing gases at equilibrium has its volume decreased, which increases the pressure, the system responds by shifting its equilibrium position to reduce the pressure. Think of it this way. When volumes decreased, pressure increases. So the system says, well, how can I, you know, account for this increase in pressure? I'm going to decrease it. So let's think about how that happens. Well, the first thing we have to do is look at the balanced chemical equation. So we'll use the Haber process again. And here we have one mole to three moles to two moles. So I have a total of four moles of reactants to two moles of product. So it looks, look here in green. If I have a decrease in volume, that means I have a less space in my container now, which increases the pressure. So now N2 and H2 are closer together and have more total moles than NH3. Thus, the reactants react together to form more NH3. So I like to think of it this way. If my pressure is going to increase, then I'm going to want to decrease it in some way. Well, if my, pressure, if my volumes decrease, that means all these four moles of particles and two moles of particles are a lot closer together. So what way could I decrease my pressure? I could react my reactants together in 2 and H2, which accounts for 4 moles, and turn them into NH3, which would take away some of the moles of particles in the container. If you take away some of those particles in the container and, make, and reduce their, I'll, I'll use a word that doesn't exist, reduce their molage here, if I reduce their number of moles, then I decrease the pressure because I'm taking some of those particles out of the equation, so to speak. So equilibrium shifts to the side that has fewer moles. So when you increase the pressure, you can decrease the pressure. And when that happens, equilibrium shifts to the side that has fewer moles. Now the second green one. If you increase the volume, you have more space. And if I have more space, get rid of all this. If I have more space, I have a decrease in pressure. Equilibrium will shift the side that has more moles. So if I have more space than my two moles, and four moles still become a factor. If I have more space, then I'm going to want to decrease. Sorry, if I have more space, I have a decrease in pressure, so I'm going to want to increase the pressure. I can increase the pressure by producing more substances that have a higher number of moles. So NH3 would decompose and break up into N2 and H2 and produce more moles inside the container, which will produce a higher pressure. So equilibrium will shift to the side that has more moles. In this case, it is our reactants. It won't always be that case, though. Now, our third one, our third condition, is when temperature changes. So the effects of a temperature change. Well, when we talk about the first two conditions, pressure and concentration, when they change, our equilibrium constant remains the same. But as temperature changes, your equilibrium constant, which we know is K, changes as well. So to better understand the relationship between K and temperature, let's think of heat as a chemical reagent. When I say chemical reagent, I just mean a part of our chemical equation, either as a reactant or product. So let's take these two statements here. In an endothermic reaction, we know that heat's being absorbed. So heat would be a reactant. In an exothermic reaction, heat is released, so heat is a product. 
Now we'll use the Haber process again as an example. So we have N2 plus H2 goes to NH3. Now the forward reaction, so this is forward, the forward reaction is exothermic, has a negative delta H here. So what would happen if this reaction was at equilibrium? We know that it has an exothermic forward reaction. Let's see what happens. If I increase the temperature, there would be a favoritism towards the endothermic reaction, which is the reverse reaction. It will be this way. Because we know if our forward reaction is exothermic, our reverse reaction has to be endothermic, a positive 92.4 kilojoules per mole. So if I increase temperature on this side, it would favor the endothermic reaction, which is the reverse reaction, because the, the endothermic process will absorb this excess heat. So if I increase the temperature, there's an unbalance, an imbalance there. To restore a balance, I have to get rid of some of that heat that I just you know, put into the system. So the endothermic reaction, which is going to absorb heat, will take on that process, meaning equilibrium will shift this way to the left. So it results in more reactants being formed. NH3 here would decompose, forming more N2 and H2, thus decreasing your K value. And you can think about your equilibrium constant expression if you want to think quantitatively how your K value would decrease. And conversely, if you decrease your temperature, it would favor the exothermic reaction, which is the Ford reaction here at negative 92.4 kilojoules per mole for your change in enthalpy. And so what happen because the exothermic process will release heat and restore balance. So if I decrease the temperature, then I'm going to want to restore balance by creating or generating more heat. And that will be the exothermic process's job to do that. And that will be a Ford reaction that favors your products. So equilibrium will shift to the right towards your products. So N2 and H2 will form more NH3, resulting in your K value being high.